we're really lucky today because we're going to have something that should have happened in March um, and we're going to have a, 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 a smaller section of what was going to happen in March but um, I'm really pleased that our scholars have agreed to do this and I'm really excited to see so many of you joining. We are recording this just so you know and I will be sharing this round um, after, after the event. Okay, I'm going to hand over to Sarah. Thank you, Sarah. Great, thanks Mary and thanks for giving us a platform to do this. Um, those of you who were going to attend the symposium in March will remember that uh, we basically scheduled the symposium right as the UK went into lockdown. So obviously that didn't end up getting to happen. Um, but we're really, really happy that we can share a couple of the presentations both this week and then two weeks from now because people worked incredibly hard on them. Um, the theme of the symposium is digital futures. And the reason that we chose that theme as both a 2018 and a 2019 class was the acknowledgement that there's a fair amount of unintentional overlap in a lot of the work we do that we don't necessarily see when we're so siloed disciplinarily. So pulling together people who were working on um, misinformation on the internet, on the ethics of AI, on uh, the pandemic, um, all gave us a lens to look at things through how they're operating in the digital space, but how they're operating from a multitude of studies, disciplines, and jobs we've all done before coming to the UK. Um, so thank you so, so much for coming to this. And thank you to all the four speakers who are going to speak today and those who will speak next week for agreeing to give it in a slightly different format than we intended in March. We do plan to hold one of these whenever the world goes back to a little bit more normal. Um, so hopefully we'll see you there in person too. Claudia, if you and Abby are all on mute, then we can go ahead. Awesome. Can you all see my screen at the moment? Yes, I can. Maybe. All right, so thank you so much for organizing this and for joining us. Uh, our, the title of our presentation is The Banality of Evil in a Datafied World. My name is Claudia Jaswin Scott, and I study data and society at the London School of Economics. And my name is Abby Lamert, and I'm studying public diplomacy this year at University College London. All right, so in 1961, the philosopher and political theorist Hannah Arendt was in Jerusalem, reporting on the trial of Adolf Eichmann for The New Yorker. Eichmann was a Nazi leader. He wasn't one of Hitler's inner circle, but he was a high-ranking cog in Hitler's machine. And in her writings, Arendt explored the banality of Eichmann's evil. It was motivated not by any deep-seated hatred, but by sheer thoughtlessness and Eichmann's desire for personal advancement. In her words, the sad truth is that most evil is done by people who never make up their minds to be good or evil. Hannah Arendt urged readers towards a process of reflexivity to prevent harms and hold people accountable for banal evil. Reflexivity means being able to examine your own feelings, reactions, and motives and how those influence what you do or think in a situation. A constant process of personal reflexivity can help us prevent thoughtless evil that contributes to both mass atrocities and other widespread societal injustices. In other words, we should constantly be making up our minds to do good. Today, the kinds of societal injustices that Arendt drew attention to in her reporting are being, being enabled and exacerbated by irresponsible uses of technology and the growth of massive global surveillance systems. The use of these systems by both private and public actors can create and perpetuate societal injustices through tracking, profiling, and nudging, and is often motivated by profit. Our personal data, information about us, and generated by us has become a commodity fueling a growing, growing surveillance economy. Today's systems of global surveillance are upheld by a wide range of actors, some of whom are well known, like Mark Zuckerberg, Cambridge Analytica, and the NSA. But those figureheads are just the all-seeing eye atop the unfinished Illuminati pyramid of potentially harmful surveillance. These very visible symbols of the new era of surveillance capitalism are upheld by complex global networks of supporting actors. This includes hundreds of thousands of academics, tech workers, and policymakers who by their thoughtlessness or inaction can contribute to harmful global surveillance. Many of us in the Zoom call will go on to work in tech, academia, or policy where we will influence emerging technologies. That means we all have a role to play in minimizing harm by developing a personal habit of reflexivity regarding our contributions. 
And reflexivity means constantly assessing our own role in these surveillance systems and in tech-related harms. Today, we're going to share three stories of people involved in these global surveillance systems to demonstrate three types of responses when confronting one's own role in enabling technological harms. If you will, three different responses to responsibility. In the first, I'll tell you about an academic who buried his head in the sand, denying responsibility for designing a system that has contributed to human rights abuses. Then I'll talk about a group of tech workers who mobilized their collective responsibility, forcing their employer to pull out of a dead, deadly government contract. And finally, we'll discuss a developing case about a paradigm shifting surveillance technology and the importance of immediate action by policymakers to minimize its harm. We hope to convince you that whether we end up in academia, the private sector, or the government, each of us has a role to play in assessing our responsibility for and taking action to prevent tech-enabled harms in our datafied world. Denial. One common but unfortunate reaction when facing blame for causing tech-enabled harm is complete denial. Rather surprisingly, one common group of responsibility deniers is academics. Take the case of Dr. Kenneth Kidd, Professor Emeritus of Genetics at Yale University. Dr. Kidd is a pioneer in the field of genetics research, and he often works with police departments. He was one of the very first researchers to convince courts of law to accept DNA evidence. And he pioneered many of the techniques to identify an individual's regional or ethnic origin from their DNA, the same techniques that underlie services like 23andMe. To support this research, Dr. Kidd had to assemble a database of DNA samples from people of different ethnicities all around the world. In 2010, he was approached by a potential collaborator, the, Chinese, the chief scientist for the Chinese Public Security Bureau. She had access to DNA samples from ethnic groups across China and would add them to his database in exchange for access to his data and techniques. And he agreed. China was the gaping hole in his database. So they began collaborating. She spent a year in his lab at Yale and they published a paper together. But Five years later, in 2015, the world began to learn a system of concentration camps in Western China to imprison Uyghurs, an ethnic minority Muslim group. The Chinese Public Security Bureau had turned the entire region into an advanced surveillance state. And as a part of those surveillance efforts, the Public Security Bureau had conducted forced DNA collection of Uyghurs in the region. There's a high chance that the Uyghur DNA samples in Dr. Kidd's database were not taken with consent, but by force. It's likely that the techniques and the data shared by Dr. Kidd are currently being used by the Chinese police to aid in their surveillance and detention of Uyghur Muslims. When asked by reporters in 2019 if he felt any sense of responsibility for collaborating with the Public Security Bureau, he said no. Dr. Kidd claimed he was following accepted practices on data ethics and collaboration. According to Dr. Kidd, his collaborator had said that all of the DNA samples were collected with informed consent. And the reporter asked, did you question that? He said, on what basis would I question it? I have no way of knowing one way or the other. The reporter followed up, do you feel you've done absolutely nothing wrong? And his response was the following, I have done nothing wrong. Obviously, this response to responsibility is not ideal and not recommended, but it is very common. In a New York Times article, the NYU Med School's head of medical ethics said, there's a kind of naivete on the part of American scientists, presuming that others will follow the same rules and standards wherever they come from. Many of us hope to someday play a role in academia. When and if we do, it's important to remember that existing systems of ethical screening and data protection are helpful, but they aren't perfect. It's also important to supplement them with our common sense. Don't just think about the implications of your research itself. Think about what could happen if your research fell into malicious hands. Now we'll use two more stories to explore two better ways of responding to one's own accountability. An alternative to denial of responsibility is a deliberate evaluation of one's own role in enabling or perpetuating harm. One group of people who are increasingly acknowledging their responsibility and leveraging their privileged role for good are tech workers. Recent years have seen a range of mobilization efforts, including walkouts, petitions, and other collective actions by workers of powerful technology companies against their employers' unjust business decisions. Google employees have been particularly active in these efforts. 
In 2018, it came to light that Google had signed a contract with the US Department of Defense called Project Maven to speed up the classification of images correct, collected by drones. Thousands of employees protested the company's involvement, raising ethical concerns about the risks of entrusting potentially lethal work to algorithms. They worried that Google's contributions to the project could accelerate the development of fully autonomous weapons. Internal emails revealed that Google exec executives believed Project Maven would open doors for larger contracts with military and intelligence agencies. Nearly 4,000 employees voiced their objection to, Project Maven con to the Project Maven contract in an internal petition, and about a dozen ended up resigning. A labor rights group called the Tech Workers Coalition also launched a petition demanding Google and other major tech companies like Amazon and IBM refuse to work with the Defense Department. The petition read, we can no longer ignore our industries and our technology's harmful biases, large-scale breaches of trust, and lack of ethical safeguards. These are life and death stakes. In addition, more than 1,000 tech scholars, academics, and researchers also signed a letter in solidarity with the Google workers. After the fierce backlash from employees and technologists, Google ultimately decided not to renew its contract for Project Maven in 2019 and also announced a new set of ethical principles to guide the development of military AI. It's hard to call this a complete victory because the lucrative contract deemed too un unethical for Google found a new home with the secretive data analytics company Palantir where they become less transparency and accountability. However, it is impossible to deny the potential power of collective action by conscientious employees. Other recent examples of mobilization in the tech industry have included employees at Amazon, Microsoft, and Salesforce protesting the company's contract with immigration and customs enforcement, Amazon and Google employees calling out company executives, executives for inaction on climate change, Facebook employees petitioning Mark Zuckerberg to reconsider allowing politicians to make false claims and ads, and Apple employees forcing Tim Cook to defend his controversial decision to remove an app used by Hong Kong protesters. Few of us will begin our careers by going straight into positions of influence. More than likely, many of us will begin as lower level employees of large organizations. But as these examples prove, employees at lower levels in large organizations can and should harness the power of collective action to help shape the missions and affect change in their organizations. The final way that we can respond effectively to our role in tech-enabled harms is to act, to use the power afforded by our particular positions to create structural change by setting appropriate policies and guidelines. This is especially relevant for those of us who hope to be leaders in policy or government spheres, as we will be the ones with the power to act unilaterally. Take the case of the recent media coverage of a small startup, Clearview AI which had decided to create a technology that the big tech companies had previously considered too taboo to them. Clearview AI's technology gives users the ability to upload a photo of someone's face, even grainy, low quality, or partial images, and within seconds, identify them by name. Clearview scraped over 3 billion photos from social media sites to associate these names and faces. The deployment of this technology raises concerns about whether near instant identification could end privacy as we know it, as well as risks about misidentification, particularly of more vulnerable individuals. Clearview AI claimed to market their technology to state and local police departments, sometimes lobbying, lobbying through state legislators. Police departments who are customers of Clearview AI already report successful identifications of criminal suspects using the app, including one case where a suspect was identified in the background of someone else's mirror selfie at the gym. But this technology poses clear potential for misuse and threats to individual privacy. If the technology falls into the hands of consumers, it essentially erases our ability to be anonymous in public. Recent investigations reveal that Clearview AI has gone far beyond partnering with law enforcement, the company had secured pay co paid contracts with actors from both the public and private sectors and circulated the app among some of the wealthiest and most powerful members of society. Its customers included the likes of the Justice Department, the FBI, US Customs and Border Protection, Interpol, hundreds of police departments, including college security, uh, countries with poor human rights records like Saudi Arabia, corporations like Macy's, Walmart, the NBA, as well as high profile celebrities and investors. The technology has been passed around like a shiny new toy among the rich and famous, with Ashton Kuch Kutcher brag bragging about it during a Hot Ones interview several months ago. Are we okay with this powerful technology being in their hands? 
Facebook, Google, and Twitter, from which Clearview AI ripped more than 3 billion photos, have demanded that the company stop scraping images for its facial recognition database. The story is still developing, and there are a few potential paths that it could take, depending on whether and how individual leaders use their power to act. First, we have the pessimistic scenario. Indiana. So I'm from the state of Indiana, which is traditionally a very Republican conservative state. In the New York Times article that first broke the story, the Indiana State Police were reported as the first paying customer of Clearview AI. In the article, they told several stories of successful uses of the technology, indicating that it's already fully operational in Indiana. As a citizen of that state, a user of Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, no one informed me that my state police would now be using this technology. No one asked my consent, and the state police have no public information acknowledging their use of it or what their use cases and limitations are. Multiple attempts to reach out to state legislators, the state police, and my state attorney general were all completely ignored. The lack of transparency over police use of this technology isn't limited to Indiana. It's true of almost every state in the country, and it's of grave concern to the privacy and civil liberties of all Americans. New Jersey offers a potentially more optimistic scenario. Coincidentally, my home state was actually the first to put a moratorium on the use of Clearview AI software. Just a couple of days after the New York Times article was published, State Attorney General Gerber Graywall took immediate action to bar police from employing Clearview AI's tool. He cited concerns about data privacy, cybersecurity, law enforcement security, and the integrity of po police investigations. He directed New Jersey's Division of Criminal Justice to investigate uses of the app and others like it by state law enforcement agencies. In a promotional video, Clearview took partial credit for a recent investigation into potential child predators in New Jersey, during which officers briefly used a free trial of the technology. Graywall sent the company a cease and desist letter asking it to stop using New Jersey state investigations to promote its products. Although police do not require the approval of state attorneys general to use tools like Clearview AI, Graywall suggests this may need to change. He told the New York Times, we need to have a full understanding of what is happening here and ensure that there are appropriate safeguards. A new bill introduced to the state legislator, legislature in February would require towns to hold public hearings before officers use any version of facial recognition technology. Though no definitive action has yet been taken in the state, it is crucial that citizens, policymakers, and the creators of potentially harmful technologies are engaging in conversations about their risks. A quick update to this section. Just in the past few days, Clearview AI actually announced that they would no longer provide their facial recognition technology to private companies due to pressure from the public. This is an important step, but law enforcement agencies and government departments continue to have access to the tool, which continues to raise serious privacy and human rights concerns. Meaningful change requires the right officials in the right positions to act move quickly to exercise their responsibility for structural change in preventing tech-enabled harms. In this talk, we've shown you three different responses to responsibility. Denial, which isn't recommended, and collective action and individual action, which offer more promising ways to prevent thoughtless tech-enabled harms. The key to reflexivity is moving past denial to consider your role and acknowledge any responsibility you may have in contributing to tech-enabled harms. The next step in reflexivity is considering how best you can use your position to take action. Are you a low-level employee in a big firm with little ability to directly cause change? Maybe you can leverage the collective influence of your peers through town halls, petitions, or organized walkouts. Are you someone in a position of privilege or authority in your organization? Can you directly impact policies that are causing harm? Then act. Take steps to prevent, undo, and correct harms that have already been done. In this new era of global surveillance, each of us has to consider how our own actions might contribute unwittingly to tech-enabled harms. Remembering what Hannah Arendt said about Eichmann, except for an extraordinary diligence in looking out for his own personal advancement, he had no motives at all. Each of us has a personal duty of reflexivity to counteract the potential, the banality of evil in an increasingly datafied world. What Arendt saw, reporting from Eichmann's trial in 1961, we would do well to remember now. Thoughtlessness can wreak more havoc than all the evil, evil instincts of man taken together. That was, in fact, the lesson one could learn in Jerusalem.
thank you all for your time. Thank you. You can, uh, if you have any follow up questions, you're welcome to contact us at the next slide, Abby. Yep. There you go. Mm -hmm. All right, friends. Thanks for listening. Uh, feel free to reach out with any questions. And we're also happy to send you any of our additional resources if anyone's interested in digging further into the topic. Thank you both. We really appreciate that. I know that both of you have to go to class now. So um, thank you very much for joining us. Sarah, do you want to introduce the next step? Sorry, yes. Um, I believe that Kyle's up next. Yes. Okay. Cool, Kyle, if you want to go ahead and put your thing on the screen. Yeah, let me share. <clears throat> Okay, hopefully you can all see that. Okay, so I'm Kyle Swanson. Uh, I'm currently doing part three maths at Cambridge. Uh, and today I'm gonna be talking a little bit about accelerating drug discovery with machine learning. And this is some work that I did in my uh, master's thesis last year uh, back at MIT. And so the problem that we're trying to solve is that develop developing drugs is very expensive and a very slow process. Um, so in 2014, it was estimated that developing a new drug costs roughly $2.6 billion, which is an insane amount. And in, addi in addition to that, it also takes a very long time, on average over 10 years, to actually take a, a drug from the initial discovery phase in the lab, all the way to actually being FDA approved and being used in the clinic. And so this is uh, obviously a very costly process, and there's a lot of room for improvement. Um, but first we might wonder what exactly is making it uh, cost so much money and take so much time. And one of the main reasons for this is that many drug candidates fail along the way from the initial discovery in the lab to their final use in the clinic. And the reason that so many drug candidates fail is that they often lack really important molecular properties. Uh, so for instance, the first and perhaps most important property of a drug is that it should actually work against the target that it's in intended to affect. Uh, so for instance, if you're trying to develop an HIV drug, then the drug should actually work against HIV. But in addition to that property, um, there are many other properties that are necessary in order for a particular molecule to actually work as an effective and safe drug. Uh, so for instance, a drug needs to be soluble, um, so it can be easily dissolved in the bloodstream, it needs to be permeable, so it can enter the cells and actually have the effect that it's supposed to have. Um, and importantly as well, it should also have very low toxicity. So in addition to actually having the effect um, that's intended, it also shouldn't harm the human in the process. And so there are a whole host of properties that are really necessary for any particular um, mo uh, molecule to work as an effective drug. And very often these properties aren't known until very far along the drug discovery pipeline. Um, so some of these might be easy to test quickly in the early drug discovery phase, um, but many of them, especially toxicity for instance, aren't really known until much farther along the pipeline when clinical trials are actually being run. And so at that point, you've already spent uh, potentially millions or billions of dollars and many years. Uh, and so it's really unfortunate when a drug then fails um, due to a property farther along the pipeline that maybe could have been predicted uh, earlier along the process. And so what we think is really important is having very fast and accurate molecular property prediction. Because if you can predict all of these properties ahead of time, uh, then you'll know which uh, molecules are most likely to actually work as a drug and you won't have as many that are failing along the process. Uh, so molecular property prediction is very important and is gonna be the focus of this talk, in fact. So what are the current methods of actually doing this molecular property prediction? Um, well, perhaps the, uh, the most common method and uh, in, in a sense, the best method is high throughput screening where you're actually running laboratory experiments. So this is where you can take the molecule and actually test it against uh, various things. You can test how soluble it is, how permeable it is, if it actually affects the target that you're interested in. Uh, and so this is sort of the gold standard. It has very high accuracy. But the problem is that uh, it's particularly this process that is so slow and expensive. Um, you have to actually manufacture the drug, actually test it, uh, and running these experiments can be quite slow. So one approximation that's often used is something called density functional theory. And uh, the, the idea behind uh, this density functional theory, or DFT, is that for certain properties at least, you can actually write out mathematical formulas that will represent the property in a particular way. 
Uh, so for instance, if you're interested in uh, the quantum mechanical energy of a molecule, uh, there's a way to actually write that out as a particular formula of uh, the various atom and bond properties of that molecule. And so you can then just write out these equations and run computer simulations to predict some of these properties. And this is nice because it's much faster and much cheaper than actually running the laboratory experiment. Uh, you don't even have to create the molecule. You can do all of this on a computer. Uh, but the problem is that it's often less accurate because the equations that you've written are often just an approximation of reality. And uh, perhaps an even bigger problem is that DFT is, uh, only has very limited applications. It can really only work for properties where you can actually write the formula down. Uh, so for instance, with quantum mechanical energy, you could actually write that as a formula. But for something like human toxicity, it's so complicated that we really can't write a formula that will um, look at a molecule and then predict if it'll be toxic to our human or not. It's simply too complicated for our current mathematical understanding of the chemistry. Um, so these are two potential methods, but what we were very interested in was whether you could use machine learning to circumvent some of these problems. And so the promise of machine learning is that it has a, a few very nice properties. Um, one is that it's extremely fast. So when you're doing these laboratory experiments, um, they can range in how long they take, but on average, they might take, let's say, a day uh, to run a lab experiment for a single molecule. Um, density functional theory, as I said, is much faster, but those equations that you're simulating on a computer are still often very slow to run because they're extraordinarily complicated calculations. And so it could take, for instance, maybe an hour to compute a single property for a single molecule. Whereas machine learning, on the other hand, has the promise of being much faster. Uh, at least with some of the software that we developed last year, you were able to make predictions on 600 molecules per second. Um, so it's many orders of magnitude faster than previous methods of doing this property prediction. Another benefit of machine learning is that it's growing increasingly accurate. Uh, so we've already seen in uh, experimentation that machine learning can often match the accuracy of those density functional theory calculations. Uh, and in certain cases, at least, not in all cases, but in certain cases, machine learning predictions are nearly as accurate as actually running the experiment in the lab. Um, so it's almost as good as actually manufacturing the molecule and testing it in person. And the final benefit is that machine learning is very broadly applicable across a whole range of properties. Uh, essentially, any property that you can write down could be learned by a machine learning model. So it can predict anything from quantum mechanical energy all the way up to human toxicity. Um, because you're not actually writing down an explicit formula for how the molecule affects that property, you can allow the machine learning model to pick up patterns um, and figure it out on its own. And so it can really apply to many properties that density functional theory couldn't before. Um, so there are a lot of very good aspects of machine learning. And so we were interested in exploring what sort of machine learning algorithms there are for this sort of property prediction and how well they would actually work. So to give an overview of what this property prediction would look like uh, in the machine learning context, the input would be a molecule and it's typically represented as something called a smile string. So this is what you're seeing on the left in the diagram. We have that long string of characters um, with letters representing the various atoms in the molecule and then some of the other symbols such as the equal signs representing the bonds in the molecule. And so we start with that smile string representation, and then we convert that into the molecular graph. Um, so this is the actual structure of the molecule, what you see on the right, where you have all of the individual atoms and bonds and all of their connections. And it's really this graph structure of the molecule that we're using as the input to our property prediction model. And then on the bottom, you can see we take that graph structure of the molecule, we feed that into our machine learning algorithm, which I'll explain in a minute. And then the goal of the machine learning algorithm is to then uh, spit out the property that we're interested in. Um, so in this case, it might uh, say either the molecule is toxic or the molecule is not toxic. And then given a training set where we know a bunch of molecules and their associated property values, we can then train this machine learning algorithm to do a better job of actually making these property predictions. So what does that machine learning algorithm actually look like? Uh, so back in the day, uh, meaning maybe uh, 10 or 15 years ago, the older machine learning algorithms were doing property prediction with something called a computed fingerprint. And so the way this works is, again, the input is the, uh, on the left is the graph structure of the molecule. Uh, and then in these methods, what you would do is you would look at that graph structure of the molecule and you would extract certain key substructures. Um, so these might be little rings in the molecule or particular functional groups that are known to have a certain uh, effect on a molecular property. 
Uh, and so you basically look through the whole molecule, try to find all of these substructures, and then build what's called a binary fingerprint, where it's basically a bunch of ones and zeros all uh, in an array. And each one will indicate if, or each one or zero indicates whether a particular substructure does or does not exist in that molecule. And so with just this binary fingerprint, you have a very concise summary of the structures that are present in that molecule. And then you can take this binary fingerprint and use it with whatever machine learning algorithm you're interested in. Because um, at this point, it's just a bunch of numbers and that can be processed easily by machine learning algorithms. Uh, so typically you would take that binary fingerprint, uh, pass that into a feed forward neural network, which is a common machine learning uh, model. And then you could use that to learn to predict the particular property that you're interested in, uh, perhaps toxicity or solubility. Um, and so this method works uh, all right, but it's really not ideal because it relies very much on the particular substructures that are extracted. And so there's still a bit of a human component in trying to figure out what are the appropriate substructures um, for a given property. And so what we were interested in and the uh, algorithm that we ended up developing was doing property prediction, not with uh, these uh, computed fingerprints relying on human judgment, but with learned fingerprints, where we actually essentially have a second stage of the machine learning model that can by itself figure out which substructures are most important for making that uh, molecular property prediction. So in this case, the input to the model is still the same, it's still that graph structure of the molecule. But in this case, rather than directly extracting substructures, we're actually going to look at the, the raw molecule by itself and look at the individual atoms and bonds within that molecule. And for each atom and bond, uh, we extract some key features. So for instance, for each atom, we'll look at the atom type. So is it a carbon atom, an oxygen atom, nitrogen atom? And for each bond, we'll look at the type of the bond. Is it a single bond or a double bond or so on? And so with those very basic properties of each atom and each bond, then we'll be able to build up a tiny little vector that'll describe that atom or bond. And that's what you're seeing in the middle figure. Uh, and so at that point, we have information about each individual atom and bond. But the goal, as before, is to try to come up with a single representation for the entire molecule. And this is where we use something called a message passing algorithm, um, which is illustrated in that middle figure, where you can see that essentially each atom and bond will communicate with its neighboring atoms and bonds with the help of a neural network, so another machine learning model. Um, and you'll actually end up building an, un, an understanding of local chemistry. Uh, so in this particular example, we're looking at that red bond in the middle. And so initially it only knows about itself. It just knows that it's a single bond. But once you do a few of these message passing steps, information from the yellow bonds and then eventually the blue bonds and the green bonds will flow across the structure of the molecule and make their way to that red bond and will inform the red bond of the atoms and bonds that are surrounding it. And so you're actually building up this understanding of local chemistry all across the molecule. Um, and this is all done with neural network layers, meaning that it's done in a, a learned sense. So the machine learning model will actually do this process differently for every property that you're interested in. And so it can learn to focus on the particular atoms and bonds that are most relevant for a particular property. And then once you've done this message passing process, then you know about the local chemistry in the molecule. And then you can basically aggregate all this information into a single representation, a single vector that represents the entire molecule. And now this single vector is a learned vector is computed by the neural network, as opposed to, be, to being handcrafted where humans had to select the substructures that they were interested in. And so you can then take this learned representation and again feed that through a final neural network layer to predict the property that you're interested in. And so the nice thing in this model is that you have uh, two layers of machine learning, both that final property prediction layer, as well as the uh, representation extraction layer. Uh, and so it can basically, you're allowing the machine learning model to have an even more flexible representation of the molecule. And so it can do even better property prediction. And so this was the, uh, the model that we developed. And we were interested in seeing how it actually works to predict many of these properties. Um, so we tried it on a whole range of public data sets, but there was one data set in particular that we were very interested in trying it on. And this was an E. coli data set where we were working with the Broad Institute to try to figure out if we could develop new antibiotics that might work against E. coli. So in this case, the property that we're interested in is for a molecule, will this molecule inhibit E. coli or not? So it's a simple yes or no prediction for a given molecule. And so the Broad Institute fortunately had uh, a nice training set of about 2,300 molecules. 
And for every one of these molecules, they knew, uh, they had tested in the lab, whether that molecule does or does not inhibit E. coli. Uh, and in that data set, there were about 120 molecules or 5% that did actually inhibit E. coli. So essentially all we had to do is take this training set and then use that model that I just described uh, to train um, the machine learning algorithm to do that E. coli prediction. And then once the model was trained up on those 2000 molecules, we could then use it to make predictions on an external set of about 6,000 new molecules that the model had never seen before. And the hope was that by predicting on these new molecules, we could uh, more uh, accurately identify molecules that might work against E. coli. So we made all of the predictions, uh, we sorted them according to which molecules our model thought might work best against E. coli. And then we tested the top 99 predictions. We actually ordered all of those molecules and tested them in the lab. And the really cool thing was that 51 of them, over 50%, did in fact inhibit E. coli. And so this means that our model is actually really good at identifying molecules that are more likely to work. Because if you had just sampled molecules randomly uh, from the training set, for instance, only 5% would have worked. Whereas when you take the molecules according to the prioritization of our machine learning model, then over 50% worked. Um, so it's saving you a lot of time by focusing on the molecules that are actually likely to work uh, in the lab. And so this was a very good proof of concept, but uh, we were interested in trying to take advantage of uh, the advantages of machine learning algorithms, and in particular, their extreme speed. Um, as I said before, machine learning is a lot faster than uh, lab experimentation or density functional theory. And so you can really work at a scale that you couldn't have done in the past. Uh, and so we retrained our model. And this time, instead of making predictions on 6,000 molecules, we actually made predictions on 107 million molecules, um, which is just beyond the scope of what previous methods could have done. Um, but with machine learning, this only took four days of computation. It was very easy you just hit go. And then four days later, all of your predictions are done. Uh, and then we did a very similar process to before. We ranked all of these molecules uh, according to what the machine learning model said. And we looked at the top couple, ordered them, tested them in the lab, and actually found eight structurally novel antibiotics. Um, so this is particularly interesting because the machine learning model wasn't just learning for, uh, to find molecules that looked identical to uh, known antibiotics. It was actually finding uh, molecules that were structurally quite different. So their graph structure looked pretty different from antibiotics that are known. And yet somehow the model actually learned just from the data to identify these as likely having an effect against E. coli. And so actually one of these uh, molecules that we discovered was particularly interesting. And so this was a molecule originally called SU3327, um, but we later named it uh, Hallison. It's named after Hal from 2001, The Space Odyssey. Um, and this molecule was interesting because it did actually work against E. coli. So our model correctly predicted that it would inhibit the growth of, the growth of E. coli. Uh, but interestingly, it actually worked against other bacteria as well, even bacteria that were resistant to essentially all known antibiotics, um, including a few of those listed on the slide. Um, and so this was actually very interesting. It seems like our model, even though it was only trained to work against E. coli, somehow actually found a mechanism that was, uh, that was uh, effective against a variety of bacteria. And so it found a very effective antibiotic. Um, and so this was all shown to be true in the lab, but we actually did additional testing with Allison and found that it works in uh, mouse models as well. So live mice that were infected with some of these bacteria were actually completely cured using these, this new drug which is really exciting. Um, and so we're continue, continuing to do some more experimentation and hopefully at a certain point, we'll actually get to human trials of this new antibiotic um, if it continues to, to work as well as it has been and if it uh, proves to be safe. And so this was sort of where the work left off at the end of last year. Um, and this was pretty exciting on its own, but we actually realized recently that uh, there are additional applications of this method and you can actually apply the methods that we've developed to the, the coronavirus that's been going around. Um, because as I said before, essentially the machine learning algorithms that we've developed are effective against any property for a particular molecule. And so that property could be <clears throat> antibiotic effectiveness, as we've looked at before, or it could be antiviral effectiveness. Uh, and so in the past month or so, we've actually been trying to see if we can use the same model uh, against COVID-19. And so in particular, in this case, the property that we're interested in is whether a given molecule will inhibit uh, the replication of SARS-CoV-2, which is the virus that's responsible for COVID-19. Um, but the problem in this case is that 
there's very limited data on this new virus precisely because it is so new. Um, with antibiotics and with many of the other properties uh, that uh, chemists are interested in, they've been testing molecules in the lab for years. And so they have huge data sets, which are essential for these uh, data hungry machine learning methods. But with SARS-CoV-2, because it's so new, there really isn't very much data to learn on. And so what we've actually been doing recently in the past couple of weeks is trying to leverage existing data from a very similar virus, which is SARS-CoV. And this is the virus that was responsible for the SARS outbreak in 2002 and 2003. And the nice thing is that there are very, uh, there are very many similarities between SARS-CoV and the newer SARS-CoV-2. And so the hope is that by training on some data from the previous virus, even though it's not quite the same, hopefully the machine learning model would still be able to pick up on enough patterns that are similar between the two viruses that any drug that could work against the original SARS-CoV might also work against SARS-CoV-2 um, if predicted by our model. And so I want to share some information about this because we've tried to make our uh, development process as open as possible. Um, so we've actually trained some of these SARS-CoV models and put them on the web um, at this web link. And I can share these slides later if you want to uh, visit that. And so you can actually go to that website, upload your own molecules and make predictions and see if there's a chance that they might work against the coronavirus. And we've actually been uh, making some of our own predictions and we started testing them in the lab and hopefully they will actually have an effect against the coronavirus in the lab. Um, and we've also recently created a new website called aicurious.mit.edu and we have a lot of new information all about uh, the coronavirus and some of our most recent efforts. <clears throat> uh, so just to summarize, what I've explained today is that machine learning for chemistry is very fast, accurate, and broadly applicable, which are some of its great benefits. And it's already starting to help chemists identify new drugs much more rapidly than in the past. Uh, and I've explained some of the applications to antibiotics, to the coronavirus, um, and beyond. But one thing that I wanted to leave you with was some really interesting future work um, that our lab has already started to work on. And this is molecular generation. So everything I've described so far requires that you already know of a particular molecule and you're simply trying to assess uh, what properties that molecule has. Um, so it requires that you've already like uh, invented the molecules that you're interested in. But there's really no reason why these machine learning models uh, couldn't be designed to actually predict their own molecules. So it's actually possible to design a machine learning algorithm so that you can tell it, I want this particular property. So I want, let's say a non-toxic molecule and then it can actually learn how to build up that molecule. So it can actually construct it atom by atom and bond by bond and actually design the molecule from scratch. And so we're very interested to see um, what these uh, models might be able to do and whether they could actually design new drugs that have never been seen before that might work against some of these diseases. So I just wanted to finish by saying thank you for listening and thank you to all my collaborators as well. Um, and I have some links on the left side if you're interested in learning more. Kyle, thank you very much. That was really interesting. Um, and hopefully we'll come up with something great in the future for Cove 2 gets to it too. So I think yeah, the next speaker is Chris. Is that right? Yeah, I, th I think that's correct. So I'll go ahead and um, share my screen with everyone and uh, get started. Chris, can you introduce yourself, please? Yeah, absolutely. So for those of you who don't know me, um, my name's Chris. Uh, I'm a 2019. My background's in, in sort of uh, uh, law, and in particular privacy law and elections law in the United States, uh, and also uh, humanities and, and social science research methods. Um, let's make sure that I've got my screen. Fantastic. All right. Um, so I, I, I just want to uh, spend about 15 minutes kind of explaining uh, what blockchain is on a very, very basic level uh, and how it would be employed in a, in a mobile voting model. Um, because sometimes we, we think best about uh, you know, policy when we think about the fundamentals and, and not the complexities, uh, especially since we don't often have political will or uh, you know, sufficient capital to think about those complexities. 
Um, I'll leave time for questions at the end, uh, but feel free to, to, you know, I certainly don't mind if you unmute yourself and ask a question or, or pop one in the chat. And uh, if Mary, you see a question in the chat, um, feel free to let me know. So I'm just gonna be looking at, at my screen. Um, awesome, thank you, Mary. Uh, I do wanna say, since my background is in law um, and not in, in sort of technical fields, um, I'm likely to share a lot of your priors if you don't have a lot of technical experience. So I hope this talk is especially useful for, for those of you who might be unfamiliar with blockchain, uh, just sort of read about it in newspapers and kind of have a vague sense of what it is, but don't quite know, know how it works. So here's the short version of the talk. Uh, mobile voting, even employing blockchain technology just isn't worth, in my opinion, the sort of imported uh, additional security risks that you have uh, when you transition from a centralized voting system to a, a decentralized voting system, especially a system that deals primarily with decentralized hardware, uh, namely mobile devices. So, and I, I hate to pick on Andrew Yang here, uh, but when your local politician of choice says something a bit like this, uh, it'd be wise for you to think something a bit like this. Uh, so let's try and understand exactly why you should be channeling distressed woman at computer. Uh, first, we have to understand what, what blockchain is. So what is blockchain? Uh, it's a technology that allows for the, the storing of data in a manner which makes that data very difficult to change after the fact because of the way that data blocks build on one another and the way in which the blocks can be instantaneously compared across multiple copies uh, of the chain to ferret out tampering. But more often than not, when people say blockchain technology or distributed ledger technology, they're generally referring to the data structure and, and not the network aspects. So we'll talk about the data structure first and then the network aspects second. Uh, let's start with a single block. So we'll start with, uh, with red block down here. A single block can contain anything that's intelligibly written in machine code, which is to say pretty much anything that can be represented by Boolean logic, uh, which if my memory serves is practically, uh, practically everything. So here we've got our red block and it might say X sends 10 units to Y, Z is registered to vote, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so we've got our block. Uh, now let's talk a bit about chaining them together. Uh, we're gonna chain the red block and the slightly darker blue block next to it uh, to make a vaguely purple block. And to do that, we're gonna use a hash function. So hash functions are computer operations that typically involve very difficult to, time-consuming mathematical operations, like finding a lot of very, very large prime numbers, for instance. Uh, it takes a computer a long time, and, and that's sort of the goal, um, is to make a computer work, and then to use that, the fact that the computer is doing that work over a certain period of time as, as proof that it's, you know, not circumventing the chain, uh, and uh, sort of as proof that, that it's doing the, 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 the correct proof in order to come up with purple block. Um, so, in more less complicated terms, what a hash function does is it takes red block and dark blue block, it adds an additional uh, sort of block of information, typically called a pad, it's usually just an additional uh, set of computer bits, uh, in, and then it results in a purple block, which is a random but unique string of numbers, uh, and it's very difficult, if not impossible, to go from the random but unique string to the original inputs. Um, so here we are, we've arrived at random but unique, Beto O'Rourke skateboarding on a stage, uh, random but unique in, in, a, in, in a good way. Uh, this means that you can take a, a hash function and you can verify if there's been changes made to the underlying blocks. So if you change, for instance, red block to yellow block, the outcome is green block and not purple block. Uh, and that means that you, whoever's looking at it from the outside, uh, can tell that there's been changes made to the underlying underlying data data structure. And this process sort of occurs all the way up the hierarchy. So we have hash chains at each point where you're combining a block until you reach sort of a top block. Uh, I'm gonna call it white block because I've run out of sort of primary colors and we've added a lot of colors together at this point. Uh, and it's the white blocks that we're chaining together to actually make a blockchain. So each white block, then we're hashing it with other white blocks you know, and, and resulting, and the result is a new sort of block of information, which is a random but unique result of everything that's happened to that point. 
Uh, so let's talk a little bit about the, the network facets of blockchain at this point. Uh, so a copy of the chain of white blocks is stored across all the computers in the network which support this particular blockchain. And so the important thing is, is uh, if someone were to make a, cha a change in one of the change, one of the chains, then you would have, say, you know, a black block hosted on one node and white blocks hosted on the other nodes. Uh, and say, if you change the, the, the green block all the way at the down, down at the bottom of the data structure to, to something else, um, then what happens is you've forked the chain. Some of the nodes in the network are carrying copies with the, the version that, that was changed with the changed version, and some are carrying uh, versions without the change. Uh, and that means you need a paradigm for deciding uh, exactly which is the authoritative copy of, of the chain. Uh, and most instantiations of blockchain just choose whichever chain is longest, meaning that the authoritative chain is the one that's growing the quickest, uh, uh, which is also typically the longest chain. Uh, and that's usually a pretty good proxy for the one with the most computing power working on it. Uh, and thus, in ex by extension, is also a pretty good proxy for the one with the most individual nodes working on the chain. Uh, and that if computing power is distributed relatively evenly in the network is a good proxy by additional extension for majority majority vote. So if you're by analogy, if you're comparing lots of different copies of the same book instantaneously and you're trying to decide which is the authoritative version, the one that most blockchains uh, decide is the authoritative one is the one that's the longest and has the most different authors working on that particular book. So now that we understand how blockchain works at an abstract level, how would that apply to a, to a mobile voting model? Uh, mobile voting for my purposes here uh, means voting on an app on your smartphone uh, that then sends your vote to a centralized vote counting apparatus that then translates into an election outcome. Where does blockchain fit in this model? Well, probably at the centralized vote counting apparatus, uh, because what it does is it stores input reliably and securely in a decentralized manner. So people are voting on their phones, sending it to the blockchain. Uh, the result, the input, the vote input is, uh, is collected by the blockchain and stored in a blockchain data structure, um, which then is translated into an electoral outcome later by additional software, uh, et cetera. Uh, most areas in the public and private sector uh, rolling out blockchain both based on a mobile voting model uh, focus uh, on, on that area. Some also focus on the sort of outcome area, but most focus on the, the, the vote counting apparatus and the, the storage of votes that are input on, on the blockchain. For places like West Virginia, which have trialed blockchain mobile distance voting, this is how they're doing it. Um, you could also uh, uh, add an additional level of programming on top of the, the chain that you're using to code for conditional outcomes. So this could be X person wins, um, but that's pretty expensive and, and is an additional step that very few places are actually actively considering uh, trialing at this point. So this is the model that we're working with. Um, and let's talk a bit about the positives because there really are just an immense amount of positives here, especially if you can imagine an election trying to be run right now in the midst of the COVID crisis, uh, people could vote on, vote on their mobile phones, and they wouldn't have to see each other, and that would be just absolutely tremendous for public health. But in general, what, we're, what I mean when I say the positives is increased turnout, especially for those individuals you know, uh, whose biggest barrier to voting is time or travel or certain medical concerns that might result in them not wanting to go to a, to a centralized voting or polling place, uh, and also increased reliability at the input storage stage. Uh, so once a vote is counted and stored on the blockchain, it's very, very difficult to change, uh, and that's a good thing. Um, this means that you can expend more resources elsewhere, protecting other parts of the system, and it also sort of in general means that elections are more democratic, and this is why a lot of people Andrew, the Andrew Yangs of the world tout, tout blockchain as, as a really good, really good idea. Unfortunately, that still leaves the input stage and crucially the user as vectors for, for malicious attack. 
Um, I want to be charitable here and compare that to an analogous level of risk that we accept in the status quo, uh, which is mail-in ballots. Uh, in both systems, users are influenceable, uh, they're prone to error, they accidentally spill their coffee on their ballots, they fill in the wrong bubble, they lose their smartphones, you know, they don't have a smartphone, um, they can't download the app, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, introducing mobile voting doesn't ameliorate or exacerbate, theoretically, any of those kinds of concerns. It does, however, allow for the manipulation of votes at the input stage, um, because what people are doing is they're voting on their mobile phones, and mobile phones are uh, particularly vulnerable um, to, to malware, uh, and they're a lot easier to tamper with than mail-in ballots. Uh, especially since they're, they're private phones, which means they're not subject to the same kind of auditing uh, concerns or uh, 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 security requirements that uh, organizations like the Federal Elections Commission mandate for state elections hardware. Um, they just wouldn't be as secure as the hardware that currently exists, you know, especially if malware already is on someone's, someone's private phone. Uh, it's just much harder, just to put it simply, it's much harder to secure 100 private phones than it is one voter database. Um, and so the risk really is just at the phone level and it, not so much at the, at the counting level, but it's at the input level. Um, so to summarize briefly, each phone is a new vector of attack. Uh, and also sort of want to point out one additional security issue is that you're depending on one version of a client software to run a blockchain. Uh, so I, I, I just, to put it in an, an analogous form, and I really can't stress this enough, it's like you took all the gold out of Fort Knox, which is at one point where the American government stored a lot of its gold, and you put it all in individual safes, one block to a safe all around the country, all the safes have been bought at your local Home Depot and they all have the same pin. Uh, you've reduced the risk that someone steals all the gold at once, but that risk was really minimal to begin with and uh, because it was in Fort Knox to begin with. And you've now reduced the security of each individual bar, which in the analogy is a vote, um, pretty substantially. Uh, and again, to return to the, the sort of you're depending on one version of a client, uh, client hardware, or excuse me, client software. Uh, if you would have multiple versions of a client software across different nodes in the network, those nodes would potentially be incompatible in the same way that if you forked a, a, a chain, those different forks are, are incompatible. Uh, the re another additional issue here is, is the sort of rhetorical appeal of blockchain is that it's unhackable which is true, you can't change things easily once they're on the blockchain um, or a blockchain, but uh, uh, that, doesn't, that doesn't necessarily uh, preclude the issues that I've raised here and, and in some cases can distract from those issues because people have this perception that it's, that it's a extremely secure way to do voting. Uh, so to summarize, you've sort of built in new vulnerabilities and you've centralized a point of failure at the client software level because everyone's using the same client software. And if that fails, you've got to do it again, especially if you don't have a paper backup copy. So the real question is, is this worth the positives that we talked about? Probably not. Uh, and, and the main reason here is because there are alternatives that increase turnout and increase the sort of democratic nature of elections that don't undermine the security of the system. So I leave aside the viability of these alternatives, but I do just want to point them out to illustrate that the security of the electoral system is not the price that we need to pay for increasing turnout. So one option, you could have mandatory voting, just make everyone vote. Another option is you could eliminate voter ID laws uh, and other legal barriers uh, to people being able to, to register to vote, and that would, that would definitely increase turnout. Um, better yet, though, you could just make the existing elections hardware much more secure. Uh, this is a project from out of Rice University that I'm happy to talk a little bit more about. Um, StarVote, it's really fantastic and has done really well in sort of initial rollouts in Austin, Texas. Um, but before I take any questions about StarVote, uh, more centralized elections hardware, I uh, just want to 
very short summary. So if you see this, you should probably think this, but if you see this, unique, random but unique, you should definitely think secure. Uh, happy to talk about anything I talked about in the presentation, anything related to blockchain or uh, electoral security writ large. Um, I'm not a huge Bitcoin expert, but I'll happily, you know, speculate about Bitcoin, I guess. Um, but uh, yeah, at this point, love to take questions. Chris, you've got uh, a question you already. Thank you time and, and for listening. Thank you, Chris. You've got a question already. Thank you for that. Um, if you check your chat, you can answer it. Yeah, absolutely. Let me just flip over to the chat here. Uh, so Paul asked, do you think that the balance of risk is different for low capacity countries where existing election practices are weaker? Uh, yeah, I, I do think that the balance of risk is different because really this is a this is a comparative to the status quo in each individual country. So at present, um, American electoral hardware is secure in some aspects and not secure in some aspects. Uh, it's secure in part in its heterogeneity. Uh, it's typically run at a state level, which means that there are 50 different security systems for counting national elections. This is kind of a good thing because it means that, you know, someone wanting to actively manipulate the result of an election would have to penetrate a lot of different systems. Um, a much smaller country that doesn't work on a federal system, uh, that has a much smaller voting population, that is a much more centralized uh, um, voting, vote counting apparatus, that would be a great opportunity to implement uh, a blockchain sort of voting structure um, because the, the comparative is a lot less secure. The additional consideration in, in that kind of a scenario is uh, if you were to um, if you were to implement uh, sort of a, a you know mobile voting technology where people are already pretty used to you know sort of perceptually trusting applications that are rolled out by the government that also matters. Um, so a place like Singapore, you know, this would have fewer perceptual effects on democracy than uh, you know a similarly sized country that has a lower level of trust in the government. Uh, and isn't quite as used to, to voting or making decisions or say tracing their behavior on a, on a mobile voting application. Um, so yeah, that, that's pretty, Paul pretty much got to the, the heart of the, the issue. It is a comparative about risk with the status quo. Awesome, I think that that's uh, the only question I see in the chat, but happy to answer more by email. Um, I can put my put my email in the in the in the chat if if that's helpful. But other than that, um, thank you, Mary and Sarah, for for setting this up and giving me an opportunity to talk about something that I think is interesting. Thank you, Chris. Thank you so much, and thank you to all of our speakers this evening. I think that's been fantastic. We've all learned a huge amount. I hopefully you can see all the people clapping or putting up clap emojis. All um, and. Um, we have part two of this on the 27th, so not next week, but the week after, and it will start at five. Hopefully I'll be able to share this um, electronically as well, as a, um, and um, we will be trying to share all of our Hangouts where we have speakers. Um, so thank you very much, and thank you in particular also to Sarah and Nick, um, who originally worked on this 